It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And what I want to do is to just share with you some very simple ideas about the problems we're facing. Some of these problems are local, some are national, some are global, but they're all tied together. They're tied together with arithmetic, and the arithmetic isn't very difficult. And what I hope I can do today is I hope I can convince you that the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. Now, in physics, the first place that you encounter the exponential function is when we're talking about the discharge of a capacitor through a resistor. And the fractional decrease in the charge on the capacitor has a minus sign and it's a constant. What we want to do is to change the minus sign to a positive sign. So instead of having something decaying a fixed fraction per unit time, we have something increasing a fixed fraction per unit time. So the exponential function is the mathematical function that we use to describe the size of anything that was growing steadily. If we had something growing 5% per year, the 5% is a fixed fraction, the per year is a fixed length of time. That's what we want to talk about, it's just ordinary steady growth. Well, if it takes a fixed, so we're talking about a situation where the time that's required for the growing quantity to increase by a fixed fraction is a constant. So if it takes a fixed length of time to grow 5%, then it follows it takes a longer fixed length of time to grow 100%. Now that longer time is called the doubling time. We need to know how you calculate the doubling time, and it's easy. You just take the number 70, divide it by the percent growth per unit time, and that gives you the doubling time. So our example, 5% per year, you divide the 5 into 70, you find that growing quantity will double in size every 14 years. Well, you might ask, where did the 70 come from? And the answer is, it's approximately 100 multiplied by the natural logarithm of 2. If you wanted the time to triple, you'd use the natural logarithm of 3. So it's all very logical, but you don't have to remember where it came from if you'll just remember 70. Now, I wish we could get every person to make this mental calculation every time we see a percent growth rate of anything in a news story. For example, if you saw a story that said things had been growing 7% per year for several recent years, you wouldn't bat an eyelash. But when you see a headline that says crime has doubled in a decade, you say, my heavens, what's happening? Okay, what's happening? 7% growth per year. Divide the 7 into 70, the doubling time is 10 years. But notice, if you're going to write a headline to get people's attention, you'd never write crime growing 7% per year because nobody would know what it means. Now, do you know what 7% really means? Let's look at an example from Colorado. The cost of an all-day lift ticket to ski at Vail has been growing about 7% per year ever since Vail first opened in 1963, and at that time you paid $5 for an all-day lift ticket. So what's the doubling time for 7% growth? 10 years. So what was the cost 10 years later in 1973? 1983. 1993. 2003. And what do we have to look forward to? This is what 7% means. Most people don't have a clue. And so how is Vail doing? Well, they're just about on schedule. So let's look at a generic graph of something that's growing steadily. After one doubling time, the growing quantity is up to twice its initial size. Two doubling times is up to four times its initial size. Then it goes to 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, and just 10 doubling times. It's a thousand times larger than when it started. You can see if you tried to make a graph of that on ordinary graph paper, the graph's going to go right through the ceiling. We've got to get used to the fact that modest growth rates give us enormous growth in modest periods of time. Let's just look at an example from the recent news. The population of Darfur in Africa was, re excuse me, was reported to have increased sixfold in four decades. Your immediate conclusion, I think, would be that must be an enormous growth rate. So you calculate the growth rate, it's only four and a half percent per year. 
enormous increases from very modest growth rates. So let's look at what happens when we have a number of doublings. Legend has it that the game of chess was invented by a mathematician who worked for a king. The king was very pleased. He said, I want to reward you. And the mathematician said, my needs are modest. Please take my new chessboard and on the first square place one grain of wheat. On the next square double the one to make two. On the next square double the two to make four. We'll just keep doubling till you double for every square. That will be an adequate payment. Well, we can guess that the king thought this foolish man. I was ready to give him a real reward and all he asked for was just a few grains of wheat. Well, let's see what's involved in this. We note there are eight grains on the fourth square. I can get this number eight by multiplying three twos together. It's two times two times two. It's one two less than the number of the square. Now that continues in each case, so when we're done, the total number of grains will be one grain less than the number I get multiplying 63 twos together. Now let's look at the way the totals build up. When we have one grain on the first square, the total on the board is one. We add two grains, that makes a total three. We add four grains, and now the total is seven. Seven is a grain less than eight. It's a grain less than three twos multiplied together. Fifteen is a grain less than four twos multiplied. That continues in each case. And when we're done, the total number of grains will be one grain less than the number I get multiplying 64 twos together. And my question is, how much wheat is that? You know, would that be a nice pile here in the room? <laughs> would it fill the building? Would it cover the city to a depth of two meters? How much wheat are we talking about? Well, the answer is it's roughly 400 times the worldwide harvest of wheat in the year 2000. That's probably more wheat than humans have harvested in the entire history of the earth. And you say, well, how did you get such a big number? And the answer is it was simple. We just started with one grain, but we let the number grow steadily till it had doubled a mere 63 times. Now, there's something else that's very important. The growth in every doubling time is greater than the total of all of the preceding growth. For example, when we put eight grains on the fourth square, the eight is larger than the total of seven that were already there. We put 32 grains on the 6th square. The 32 is larger than the total of 31 that were already there. Every time the growing quantity doubles, it takes more than all you'd used in all the preceding growth. Well, let's translate that into the energy crisis. Here's an ad from the year 1975. It asks the question, could America run out of electricity? America depends on electricity. Our need for electricity actually doubles every 10 or 12 years. That's an accurate reflection of a very long history of steady growth of the electric industry in the United States, growth at a rate of around 7% per year, which would go with doubling every 10 years. Now, with all that history of growth, they expected the growth would just go on forever. Fortunately, it stopped, not because anyone understood the arithmetic, it stopped for other reasons. But let's ask, what if? Suppose the growth had to continue, then we would see here the thing we just saw on the chessboard in the 10 years following the appearance of this ad. In that decade, the amount of electrical energy we would have used in the United States would have been greater than the total of all of the electrical energy we had ever used in the entire preceding history of the steady growth of that industry in our, our country. Now, did you realize that anything is completely acceptable? A 7% growth per year could give such an incredible consequence that in just 10 years you would use more than all that had been used in all of the preceding growth. Well, that's exactly what President Carter was referring to in his famous speech on energy. One of his statements was this, he said, and in each of those decades, more oil was consumed than in all of mankind's previous history. By itself, that's a stunning statement. But now you can understand it. The president was telling us a simple consequence of the arithmetic of 7% growth each year in world oil consumption, and that was the historic figure up until the 1970s. Now, a few years ago, I had a class of non-science students who were interested in problems of science and society. We spent a lot of time learning to use semi-logarithmic graph paper, which is printed in such a way that these equal spaces on the vertical axis each represent an increase by a factor of 10. 
So they go from 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. The reason you use this special paper is that on this paper, a straight line represents steady growth. Now we worked a lot of examples. I said to the students, let's talk about inflation. Let's talk about 7% per year. It wasn't this high when we did this. It's been higher since then. Unfortunately, it's lower now. And I said to the students, you have roughly 60 years life expectancy ahead of you. Let's see what some common things will cost if we have 60 years of 7% annual inflation. Well, the students found that a 55 cent gallon of gasoline will cost $35.20. $2.50 for a movie will be $160. The $15 sack of groceries my mother used to buy for a dollar and a quarter, that'll be $960. $100 suit of clothes, $6,400, a $4,000 automobile will cost a quarter of a million dollars and a $45,000 home will cost nearly $3 million. And I like to ex really get students to realize that you can do this arithmetic in your head. We're asking about 7% inflation per year. The doubling time is 10 years. So there are six doublings across here, and on my fingers I can count 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. All the right-hand numbers are 64 times the left-hand numbers. You need to get students to recognize that they can do this in their head. Well, I gave the students these data. These came from a Blue Cross Blue Shield ad. It appeared in Newsweek magazine, and the ad gave these figures to show the cost escalation of gallbladder surgery. In the year since 1950, when that surgery cost $361, and I said, make a semi-logarithmic plot. Let's see what's happening. Students found that the first four points lined up on a straight line whose slope indicated inflation of 6% per year. The fourth, fifth, and sixth were on a steeper line, almost 10% inflation per year. Well, then I said to the students, run that steeper line on out to the year 2000. That's 11 years ago. Let's get an idea what gallbladder surgery might cost. The answer is $25,000. The lesson there is awfully clear. If you're thinking about gallbladder surgery, do it now. <laughs> In the summer of 1986, the news reports indicated that the world population had reached the number 5 billion people growing at the rate of 1.7% per year. Your reaction to 1.7 might be to say, well, that's so small. Nothing bad could ever happen at 1.7% per year. So you calculate the doubling time, you find it's only 41 years. Now that was back in 1986. More recently, in 1999, we read that the world population had increased from 5 billion to 6 billion people. The good news is that the growth rate had dropped from 1.7 to 1.3 percent per year. The bad news is that in spite of the drop in the growth rate, the world population today is increasing by something like 75 million people every year. Now if that current modest 1.3 percent per year could continue, the world population would reach a density of one person per square meter on the dry land surface of the earth in just 780 years, and the mass of people would equal the mass of the earth in just 2,400 years. Well, we can smile at those. We know they couldn't happen. This one makes for a cute cartoon. The caption says, excuse me, sir, but I am prepared to make you a rather attractive offer for your square. There's a very profound lesson in that cartoon. The lesson is that zero population growth is going to happen. Now let's state that conclusion in other terms and say it's obvious. People could never live at that density on the dry land surface of the earth. Therefore, it's obvious that zero population growth is going to happen. Now we can debate whether we like zero population growth or don't like it. It's going to happen whether we debate it or not. Whether we like it or not, it's absolutely certain people could never live at that density on the dry land surface of the earth. Therefore, today's high birth rates will drop, today's low death rates will rise till they have exactly the same numerical value and that'll certainly be in a time short compared to 700 years. So maybe you're wondering, well, what options are available if we wanted to address the problem? 
In the left-hand column, I've listed some of those things that we should encourage if we want to raise the rate of growth of population and in so doing make the problem worse. Just look at the list. Everything in the list is as sacred as motherhood. There's immigration, medicine, public health, sanitation. Now, these are all devoted to the humane goals of lowering the death rate. And that's very important to me if it's my death they're lowering. But then I've got to realize that anything that just lowers the death rate makes the population problem worse. There's peace, law and order. Scientific agriculture has lowered the death rate due to famine. That just makes the population problem worse. It's been widely reported that the 55 mile an hour speed limit in the state saved thousands of lives. If that's the case, that just makes the population problem worse. Clean air makes it worse. Now in this column are some of the things we should encourage if we want to lower the rate of growth of population and in so doing help solve the population problem. Well, there's abstention, contraception, abortion, small families, stop immigration, disease, war, murder, famine, accidents. Smoking clearly raises the death rate. Now that helps solve the problem. Well, remember our conclusion from the cartoon of one person per square meter, we concluded that zero population growth is going to happen. We can state that conclusion in other terms and say it's obvious nature is going to choose from the right-hand list and we don't have to do anything. The only thing we have to do is prepare ourselves then to <coughs> live with nature's choice from the right-hand list. So. The only thing, our uh, one option that we have is to choose first from the right-hand list before nature makes the choice. So, what we've got to find something here we can go out and campaign for. Anyone here for promoting disease? We now have the capability of incredible war. Would you like more murder, more famine, more accidents? Well, here you can see the human dilemma because everything that we regard as good makes a population problem worse. Everything we regard as bad helps solve the problem. Now there is a dilemma, if ever there was one. Now the one question is education. Does it go in the left-hand column or the right-hand column? I'd have to say thus far in the United States at least, it's been firmly in the left-hand column. It's done very little to reduce ignorance of the problem. So where do we start? Well, let's start in my hometown of Boulder, Colorado. There is a graph of Boulder's population, 1950, 1960, 1970. That 20-year interval, Boulder's population growth rate averaged 6% per year. With big efforts, we've been able to slow it a little bit. There's the 2000 census figure. Well, I like to ask people, let's go another 70 years, another human lifetime beyond 2000, and ask, what rate of growth of Boulder's population would we need throughout that 70 years so at the end of 70 years Boulder's population would equal today's population of your choice of major American cities? Boulder in 70 years could be as big as Boston is today if we just grew 2.58 percent per year. If we thought Detroit was a better model we'll have to shoot for three and a quarter percent per year. Remember the historic figure, 6% per year. If that could continue for one lifetime, the population of Boulder would be larger than the population of Los Angeles. Oh, well, I'll tell you, you couldn't put the population of Los Angeles in the Boulder Valley. Therefore, it's obvious. Boulder's population growth is going to stop. The only question is, will we be able to stop it while there's still some open space? Or will we wait until it's wall-to-wall -wall people and we're all choking to death? Now we don't need to wonder what will be the effect of growth on Boulder because Boulder tomorrow can be seen in Los Angeles today. And for the price of an airplane ticket, we can step 70 years into the future and see exactly what it's like. Well, what is it like? Here is an interesting headline from Los Angeles. That may have something to do with this headline about Los Angeles. <coughs> now, <coughs> how are we doing in Colorado? The Denver Post tells us we're the growth capital of the USA and proud of it. 
The Rocky Mountain News tells us to expect another million people in the front range in the next 20 years. And what are the consequences of all this growth? We know them all in advance. We have crowded highways, we have crowded schools, we have polluted air, we have polluted water, we have higher taxes, we know the whole thing. But we're going for just as much growth as we can in Colorado. Well now, as you can imagine, growth control is very controversial, and I treasure the letter from which these quotations are taken. This letter was written to me by a leading citizen of our community. He's a leading proponent of controlled growth. He writes, I take no exception to your arguments regarding exponential growth. I don't believe the exponential argument is valid at the local level. So you see, arithmetic doesn't hold in Boulder. <laughs> Now, I have to admit, that man has a degree from the University of Colorado. It's not a degree in mathematics, in science, or in education, in, in engineering. Well, let's look now at what happens when we have this kind of steady growth in a finite environment. Bacteria grow by doubling. One bacterium divides to become two. Two divide to become four. The four become eight, sixteen, and so on. Suppose we had bacteria that doubled in number this way every minute. Suppose we put one of these bacteria in an empty bottle at 11 in the morning and then observe that the bottle's full at 12 noon. Now there's our case of just ordinary steady growth. It has a doubling time of one minute and it's in the finite environment of one bottle. So I want to ask you three questions. Number one, at what time was the bottle half full? Would you believe 11.59? one minute before 12 because they double in number every minute. Remember, please remember, this kind of steady growth is the centerpiece of the entire global economy. Second question, if you were an average bacterium in that bottle, at what time would you first realize that you were running out of space? Well, let's just look at the last minutes in the bottle. At 12 noon, it's full. One minute before it's half full, two minutes before it's a quarter full, then an eighth and a sixteenth. Well, let me ask you, at five minutes before twelve, when the bottle's only three percent full, and is ninety-seven percent open space just yearning for development, how many of you would realize that there was a problem? Now, in the ongoing controversy over growth in Boulder, someone wrote to the newspaper a few years ago and said, look, there's no problem with population growth in Boulder because, the writer said, we have 15 times as much open space as we've already used. So let me ask you, what time was it in Boulder when the open space was 15 times the amount of space we'd already used? And the answer is it was four minutes before 12 in Boulder Valley. Well, suppose that at two minutes before 12, some of the bacteria realize that <laughs> they're running out of space, so they launch a great search for new bottles. They search offshore and on the outer continental shelf and the overthrust belt and in the Arctic and they find three new bottles. Now that is a colossal discovery. That discovery is three times the amount of resource they ever knew about before. They now have four bottles before the discovery there was only one. Now surely this will give them a sustainable society, won't it? Well, you know what the third question is. How long can the growth continue as a result of this magnificent discovery. And just look at the score. At 12 noon, one bottle's filled, there are three to go. 12.01, two bottles are filled, there are two to go. And at 12.02, all four are filled, and that's the end of the line. You don't need any more arithmetic than this to evaluate the absolutely contradictory statements that we've all heard and read from experts who tell us in one breath we can go on increasing our rates of consumption of fossil fuels. In the next breath they say, but don't worry, we'll always be able to make the discoveries of new resources that we need to meet the requirements of that growth. Well, a few years ago in Washington, our energy secretary observed that in the energy crisis, we have a classic case of exponential growth against a finite source. So let's look at some of these finite sources. We turn to the work of the late Dr. M. King Hubbard. He's made here a semi-logarithmic plot of world oil production 
from the year 1870 up here to 1970. And you can see on this semi-logarithmic plot, the line's approximately straight, average growth rate very close to 7% per year. So it's logical to ask, well, how much longer could that 7% continue? Well, that's answered by the numbers in this table. In the top line, the numbers tell us that in the year 1973, world oil production was 20 billion barrels. Total production in all of history, including that 20, was 300 billion. The remaining reserves, 1,700 billion. Now, those are data. The rest of this table is just calculated out. Assume the historical 7% growth had continued in the years after 1973, exactly as it had been for 100 years before then. Well, now, in fact, the growth stopped. It stopped largely because OPEC raised their oil prices. So we're asking here, what if? Suppose we just said, you know, it's been awfully nice on that 7% curve. Let's just stay on it as long as we can. All right, let's go down to 1981. By 1981 on the 7% curve, total usage in all of history would add up to 500 billion barrels. The remaining reserves at that point, 1,500 billion. The reserves at that point are three times the total of everything that had been used in something like a hundred years of the oil industry on this earth. By most measures, you'll say that is an enormous remaining reserve. But what time was it when the remaining reserve was three times the total of all that you'd used in all of history? The answer, two minutes before 12. Well, we know for 7% annual growth, the doubling time is 10 years. We go from 1981 to 1991. By 1991 on the 7% curve, the total usage in all of history would add up to 1,000 billion barrels. There'd be 1,000 billion left. At that point, the remaining oil would be equal in quantity to the total of all we'd used in the 130 years or so of the oil industry on this earth. By most measures, you'd say that is still an enormous remaining reserve. But what time was it when the remaining reserve was equal to all that we'd used in all of history? And the answer is it was one minute before 12. And so one more decade of 7% growth takes us up to the turn of the century, and that's when 7% would finish using up the oil reserves of the earth. Well, it's interesting to see what the experts say. Here's an interview in Time Magazine with one of the most widely quoted oil experts in all of Texas. And he asked, said, is asked, but haven't many of our bigger fields been drilled nearly dry? And he responds saying there's still as much oil to be found in the U.S. as has ever been produced. Now let's assume he was right. What time was it? And the answer is, it was about one minute before 12. I've seen several things this guy's written. I don't think he had any understanding of this very simple arithmetic. So let's look at this in a very nice graphical way. Suppose the area of the tiny rectangle in the upper left represents all the oil we used on this earth before 1940. Then in the 40s, we used this much. That's equal to all we used in all of history. In the decade of the 50s, we used this much. That's equal to all we'd used in all of history. Again, in the 60s, consumption equals all of the previous consumption. Here we see graphically what President Carter told us. Now, if that 7% had continued through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there's what we need. But that's all the oil there is. Now, there's a widely held belief that if you throw enough money and holes in the ground, oil is sure to come up. Well, there will be discoveries in new oil. There may be major discoveries, but look, we have to discover this much new oil if we would have that historic 7% growth continue 10 more years. So ask yourself, what do you think is the chance that oil discovered after the close of our meeting today will be in an amount equal to the total of all we used in all of history and then realized if all that new oil could be found, that would let the historic 7% growth continue 10 more years. Well, let's look at domestic production of oil in the lower 48 states. Again, this is from the work of Dr. Hubbard. And we can see here's a long period of approximately straight line on this semi-log rhythmic graph. But you can see that for some time now, production has fallen below the growth curve, while our demand 
continued on up this growth curve until the 1970s and it's obvious the difference between those two curves has to be made up with imports and it was in early 1995 that we read that the year 1994 was the first year in United States history in which we had to import more oil than we were able to take from our ground ourselves. Now maybe you're wondering, does it make any sense to imagine that we could have steady growth in the rate of consumption of a resource till the last bit of it was used and then the rate of consumption would plunge abruptly to zero? And I say, no, that doesn't make sense. And you say, okay, why bother us with the calculation of this expiration time? My answer is this, every segment of our society, our business leaders, government leaders, political leaders, the local level, state level, nationally, everyone aspires to maintain a society in which all measures of material consumption continue to grow steadily year after year after year, world without end. Now since that is so central to everything we do, we ought to know where it would lead. On the other hand, we should recognize there's a better model. And again, we turn to the work of the late Dr. Hubbard. He's plotted the rate of consumption of resources that have already expired, finds, yes, there is an early period of steady growth in the rate of consumption, but then the rate goes through a maximum and comes back down in a nice, approximately symmetric bell-shaped curve. Now, when he fitted this data some years ago to the data on U.S. oil production, he found that at that time we were right here. We had used something like one half of the recoverable conventional oil that was ever in the ground in the United States. That's roughly what that expert from Texas said. Now let's see what it means. It means that from now on domestic oil production in the U.S. can only go downhill and it's downhill all the rest of the way. And it doesn't matter what the politicians say in Washington, D.C. Now it means we could work hard and put some bumps on the downhill side of the curve. You'll see there are bumps on the uphill side. There's debate over drilling in the Arctic wildlife refuge. I have seen the estimate that they might find 3.2 billion barrels of oil up there. 3.2 billion is the area of that little tiny square. That's less than one year's consumption in the United States. So let's look at the curve in this way. The area <coughs> under the entire curve represents all the conventional recoverable oil that was ever in the ground in the United States. Here we've divided that into three parts, unshaded on the left. That's the oil we've taken from the ground. We've used it. It's gone. Shaded here is a narrow band. That's the oil we've drilled into. We've discovered it. We're pumping on it today. Shaded in green on the right is the undiscovered oil. We have very good ways now of estimating how much oil remains undiscovered. This is the oil we're looking for in all the places where drilling is going on. This is the oil we've got to find if we're going to make it down the curve on schedule. Now every once in a while someone reminds me that a hundred years ago somebody did a calculation and predicted that the U.S. would be out of oil in 25 years. We obviously were not. The calculation must have been wrong. Therefore, of course, all calculations are wrong. Well, let's understand what happened. This band of discovered oil a hundred years ago was over in here somewhere. At that time, they had no idea how much oil was undiscovered, so they did the best they could. They took the oil they had discovered, divided it by how rapidly it was then being used, and come up with something like 25 years. It's pretty clear you've got to make a new calculation every time you make a new discovery. We're not asking today how long will the discovered oil last. We're asking about the discovered and the undiscovered. We're now asking about the rest of the oil. And what does the U.S. Geological Survey say? Back in 1984, the survey reported that the estimated U.S. supply from undiscovered resources and demonstrated reserves is 36 years at present rates of production or 19 years in the absence of imports. Five years later, in 1989, the 36 years is down to 32 years, the 19 years is down to 16 years, so the numbers are holding together as we march down the right-hand side of the Hubbard curve. Now around the year 2000, the Geological Survey did another major evaluation of estimated resources and came up with much more optimistic numbers. Geologists tell me that these numbers include resources 
whose probability of being found is down at the 5% level. So maybe you're wondering, why didn't somebody tell us this? It was back in 1956 that Dr. Hubbard addressed a convention of petroleum geologists and engineers. He told them that his calculations led him to conclude that the peaks of U.S. oil and gas production could be expected to occur between 1966 and 1971. No one took him seriously. So let's see what's happened. The data here are from the Department of Energy. A long period of approximately steady growth. Here's 1956 when Dr. Hubbard made his prediction, his calculation. And his calculations led him to conclude that the peaks of U.S. oil and gas production would be between 1966 and 1971. There's the peak in 1970. It was followed by a very rapid decline. Then there was discovery of oil in Alaska and the Alaska pipeline started delivering oil and there was a partial recovery. That peak had, production has now peaked and everything is going downhill in unison on the right hand side of the curve. And when I go to my home computer to calculate the parameters of the Gaussian error curve that's the best fit to the scattered data, I find from that best fit it looks to me as though we've consumed something like 85% of the recoverable conventional oil that was ever in the ground in the U.S. and we're coasting downhill now on the last 15% of that once enormous resource. So we have to ask about world oil. Dr. Hubbard projected that the world peak would occur sometime around mid-1990s, around 1995. So let's see what's happened. Here are the data on world oil production. Long period of steady growth. There's a big drop there, speedy <coughs> recovery, an enormous drop, and a very halting and uncertain recovery. Each of these drops is due to a price hike from OPEC in the 1970s. Well, it's clear we're not yet over the peak. So now, if I want to do my curve fitting, I have to go to the geology literature and ask the literature, what do you think is the total amount of conventional oil we will ever find on this earth? The consensus figure is around 2,000 billion barrels. Now, it's very uncertain. Plus or minus maybe 50%. If you plug in 2,000 billion barrels and get the best fit, to the data for world oil production, you find the peak should occur in 2004. If you assume there's 50% more than the consensus figure, the peak moves back to 2022. If you assume there's twice the consensus figure, the peak moves back to 2037. So no matter how you cut it, young people today are going to see the world oil production peak we've got to ask ourselves, what's, going to, what's life going to be like on this earth when we have declining oil production, we have growing world population, we have growing world per capita demand for oil? Think about it. The discussion in the literature suggests that we are very close to the peak. There are some people I've read who say the peak has passed, it's all clouded by the economic downturn, so it's not clear exactly what's happened. And we'll have to have a number of years of downturn before we can say, yeah, the peak was back there. So we, we're just not certain, but it could be any time now. In <coughs> March of 1998, in Scientific American, there was a major article by two petroleum geologists. They predicted that the peak would occur sometime late in this first decade of the 21st century. Now that article in Scientific American triggered enormous discussion. It triggered articles such as this. This appeared in Fortune magazine, the famous business magazine in the States. And this article was telling us about how we'll have oil forever. And in this article we read about an e economics professor at MIT who is commenting on the study by the petroleum geologist and he said this analysis by the geologist is a piece of foolishness. The world will never run out of oil, not in 10,000 years. Now there will be oil in the ground 10,000 years from now. We can't get it all. 
But you know, the tone of the article kind of gives the reader the feeling that we can run our SUVs for another 10,000 years, and I don't know of a shred of evidence that could be used to support that. Now, we've all read and heard learned people tell us that the world oil resources today are larger than they've ever been any time in history. Well, let's look at some data. The bar graph here represents annual discoveries of new oil, and the solid line represents annual production of new oil, of oil. Now, if all those big resources that the experts tell us are there, why don't they show up as new discoveries? Now, here's where we are today, somewhere right about in here, and they've extrapolated this and assume it'll just continue a decline as in, in the normal way, but there will certainly be ups and downs here. The thing to note is that what we're taking out of the ground each year now is something like three times what we're finding each year. And, well, you know what happens to your savings account in the bank if your withdrawals are three times your deposits for any length of time. This isn't rocket science. This is very plain, very easy to understand. And we can expect that these discoveries will continue in a general trend as indicated here with ups and downs. But look where we are in the production and how much longer can we continue that. Now, <clears throat> in an interview with James Fallows, editor of the Atlantic Monthly, former President Bill Clinton cited peak oil as one of three major issues that look different to him now than they did to him when he was president. Clinton said as president he had never received a security briefing which stated that by 2010 or so we'll reach peak oil production globally. He had a whole Department of Energy to tell him about these things and he never got the word. Now, it wasn't because the Energy Department didn't know. On the May 1st, 1996, during the Clinton administration, I gave this talk, including the discussion of the Hubbard curve, at the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the Department of Energy. My host was a Ph.D. non-scientist who was head of the Petroleum Division. After the talk, he took me to lunch. And over lunch, he said, you don't have to worry about petroleum. We've got everything under control. Now, the Oil and Gas Journal in 1998 reported that the United States Secretary of Energy has issued his comprehensive national energy strategy, a set of policy goals that include halting the slide of U.S. oil production by the year 2005. So let's go back and look at that graph of U.S. oil production. Here's 1998 when the Secretary of Energy made the projection that we're going to reverse the downslide by 2005. What do you think is the chance that we can make any big change in this? Now in the year in 2009 there was a little bit of an upturn. So there, there's a little, going to be a little bump on the downhill side of the curve. But the idea of reversing the down curve so we can get back to the lush days of high petroleum production in the U.S. seems to me to be highly improbable. So we have to look and see what some of the expert groups are saying. Here, for instance, from the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., we read that peak oil production predictions about impending decline of global rates of oil production are based on scant evidence and dubious models of how the oil market responds to scarcity. Here is the publisher of Forbes magazine, the famous international business magazine, he writes, as long as entrepreneurs and investors are given a free hand, drop your fears about finite resources. History speaks and overwhelmingly says that, man, that resources come from man's inventive capability. We are not, nor have we ever been bound by finite resources. Here is a columnist in Forbes magazine who tells us that all the rest of the old scarcities are tumbling down the same steep slope toward unlimited supply at zero cost. Maybe you've noticed the zero cost gasoline at the filling stations recently. 
Here is the chairman of the Resources Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, and he asserts that America has no shortage of oil. Washington has a shortage of political will to let American workers go get it. Now here is Farid Zakaria writing in Newsweek magazine. His usual subjects are political science in the Middle East and Asia, and I've always enjoyed what he reads. I thought it had been very reasonable. But now he's writing on energy, and I noticed recently he switched over to Time magazine. Zakaria writes that the world's going to require much more energy in the future. The mathematics is pretty simple. Today there are about 6.7 billion people on Earth. By 2050 there will be more than 9 billion. To sustain these extra 2.3 billion people, while raising standards of living everywhere, we will need to consume about twice as much energy as we do today. We have many of the technologies we need. If we put them to work and create systems that allow for the growth we want without running out of energy or harming the environment, then we will have achieved true energy independence. Now let me paraphrase Zakaria. What he is telling us is, if everything works out, then everything will work out. <laughs> Not very enlightening. And Zakaria goes on to say an energy revolution would produce a world in which we can use lots of energy without worrying about its costs or consequences. This is a wonderful example of Walt Disney's first law, wishing will make it so. Zakaria said that we should look at the math. If we look at the math, we can see that Zakaria's pres prescription for solving the energy problem simply won't work because it ignores the math. Now, in that same issue of Newsweek magazine was an article by Newt Gingrich, who's now talking about running for president of the U.S. Gingrich writes that the energy crisis is an artificial one created by bad policies. Every American president since Richard Nixon has spoken about the need to make America more energy independent. Despite their strong words, no rational strategy has been implemented for achieving that goal. Genrich says shale oil reserves in parts of Colorado and Utah could hold upward of a trillion barrels of oil more than three times the proven reserves of Saudi Arabia. Nuclear power is a clean source of energy that produces zero carbon emissions. Well, let's look at that shale oil. Here we read about the shale oil project that was started in 1964, was bought and sold many times. In 1981, Exxon bought out the existing plant and started construction of a commercial shale oil plant. On May 2nd, 1982, Exxon announced the termination of the project, laying off more than 2,000 workers. You have to look at the net energy. How much energy must you invest in order to get one unit of energy in return? Now, with petroleum 50, 60 years ago, you could get something like 100 units of energy return for one unit of energy expended. That's a fabulous return on investment. Now we're getting something like 10 to 1, which is still very good. It's not clear to me, and I haven't seen any analysis, it's not clear to me that they'll even get 1 to 1 with the shale oil. So Ginrich closes by saying, instead America is suffering from an artificial energy crisis, one that is the product of our government's policies. It's time for America to end the artificial energy crisis. Now here's somebody who's got a different approach, a very prominent radio commentator, and he says that we can grow corn, distill it into ethanol, and run all the vehicles in the United States on ethanol. He supports this by saying today ethanol production displaces over 43.5 million barrels of imported oil annually. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Until you think. First question you've got to ask is 43 and a half million barrels. What fraction is that of vehicle consumption in the U.S. in a year? And the answer, 1%. You would have to multiply corn production devoted to ethanol by a factor 100 just to make the numbers look right. But there's a bigger problem. It takes diesel fuel to plow the ground, to plant the corn, to make the fertilizer, to make the corn grow. 
takes more energy to distill the, the corn and finally you get a gallon of ethanol. You will be lucky if there's as much energy in the gallon as it took to produce it. In general, ethanol is a loser. And so now we have to ask, what about global warming? If any fraction of the observed global warming can be attributed to the action of humans, then this is clear proof that the human population living as we do has exceeded the carrying capacity of the earth. So as a consequence, it's an inconvenient truth that all proposals and efforts at the local, national, or global levels to slow global warming to achieve sustainability that do not advocate reducing populations to sustainable levels are what Mark Twain called silent lies. Vice President Al Gore led the way with his stunning documentary film and associated book, An Inconvenient Truth. In the book, Gore writes, quote, the fundamental relationship between our civilization and the ecological system of the earth has been utterly and radically transformed by the population explosion. He understands the cause of the problem. In the last chapter of the book, the title is, so here's what you personally can do to help solve the climate crisis. He lists 36 specific recommendations such as choose energy, efficient lighting, drive smarter, consume less, goes down the list of usual suspects and he never mentions addressing the cause of the problem. It's politically incorrect to identify overpopulation as the fundamental cause of global warming. And so now the whole nation is following Al Gore. Governments and environmental organizations are producing numerous learned reports. The entire business, political, and environmental establishments are completely paralyzed by political correctness. I think it's intellectually dishonest to talk about saving the environment and sustainability without stressing the obvious fact that stopping population growth is a necessary condition for saving the environment and for sustainability. Now it's not a sufficient condition. Stopping population growth won't guarantee sustainability, but it's absolutely guaranteed that you can't have sustainability without stopping population growth. So what do we do? In the words of Winston Churchill, sometimes we have to do what is required. As a nation, we've got to get serious about renewable energy. We must educate all of our people to an understanding of the arithmetic and the consequences of growth, especially in terms of populations and in terms of the Earth's finite resources. We must educate people to recognize the fact that growth of populations and or growth of rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. This is reflected in the first law of sustainability population growth and or growth in the rates of consumption of resources cannot be sustained. This is based on arithmetic. It isn't debatable unless you want to debate arithmetic. There's the first law. We've all heard many learned experts talk about all aspects of sustainability. How many of these experts have told us that we have to stop the growth in population and the growth in rates of consumption of resources if we're going to achieve sustainability. We must educate people to see the need to examine carefully the allegations of the technological optimists who assure us that science and technology will always be able to solve all of our problems of population growth more food, energy, and resources. Now, chief among these economists was the late Dr. Julian Simon, formerly professor of economics and business administration at the University of Illinois, later in the same capacity at the University of Maryland. With regard to copper, Simon has written that we will never run out of copper because copper can be made from other metals. Well, the letters to the editor jumped all over and told him about chemistry. He just brushed it off. He said, don't worry, if it's ever important, we can figure out how to make copper out of other metals. 
Now, Simon had a book that was published by the Princeton University Press. In that book, he's writing about oil from many sources, including biomass. Simon writes, clearly there's no meaningful limit to this source except for the sun's energy. And he goes on to write, but even if our sun were not so vast as it is, there may well be other suns elsewhere. <laughs> now, Simon's right. There are other suns elsewhere. But the question is, would you base public policy on the belief that if we need another sun, we will figure out how to go get it and haul it back into our solar system? Now you can't laugh. For decades before his death, this man was a trusted policy advisor at the very highest levels in the White House and in the Congress, and he is still worshipped by the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal. And so to be successful with this experiment of human life on Earth, we have to understand the laws of nature as we encounter them in the studies of science and mathematics. We should remember Eric Severide's law. It's one of the most important laws I've ever encountered. He wrote that the chief source of problems is solutions. Now let's just look at an example from Colorado. Interstate Highway 25 south of Denver was crowded. That was the problem. What was the solution? Enormous expenditure of money to add extra lanes to the line. Now what do you know will be the condition of those extra lanes in just a very few years? And the answer is they will be as crowded as the earlier lanes were before they started the project. And that's the new problem created by the solution to the old problem. We should remember the words of Aldous Huxley that facts do not cease to exist because they're ignored. We should remember the message of this cartoon. Thinking is very upsetting. It tells us things we'd rather not know. We should remember the words of Galileo written in the year 1615. He says, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with senses, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their use. Now except for the petroleum graphs, the things I've told you are not predictions of the future. I'm only reporting facts and the results of some very simple arithmetic. But I do this with confidence that these facts, this arithmetic, and more important, our level of understanding of them will play a major role in shaping our future. Now don't take what I've said blindly or uncritically because of the rhetoric or for any other reason. Please, you check the facts. Please check my arithmetic. If you find errors, please let me know. If you don't find errors, then I hope you'll take this very, very seriously. Now you are important people because you can think. If there's anything in short supply in this world today, it's people who are willing to think. And the central message of all of this is this. We cannot let other people do our thinking for us. So here's a challenge. Can you think of any problem on any scale from microscopic to global whose long-term solution is in any demonstrable way aided, assisted, or advanced by having larger populations at the local level, the state level, the national level or globally. Can you think of anything that will get better if we have more people in our towns, our cities, our state, our nation or on this earth? Anything that will get better in the long run. And I'll close with these words from the late Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote that unlike the plagues of the dark ages, or contemporary diseases which we do not yet understand, the modern plague of overpopulation is soluble by means we have discovered and with resources we possess. What is lacking is not sufficient knowledge of the solution, but universal consciousness of the gravity of the problem and the education of the billions who are its victims. And so I hope I've made a reasonable case from my opening statement that I think the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand this very simple arithmetic. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for such